This week on the record, Illinois bans assault weapons and promises workers one week of guaranteed paid sick leave. House Republicans in Illinois nominate a woman to lead their chamber for the first time in history. New GOP leader Tony McCombie joins us on the record. And in Missouri, the House and Senate set the rules and chased down their agenda on this new year. Senate Republican Nick Schroyer comes on the record as well. And the latest on the fight for student loan debt forgiveness, President Biden's education secretary, Miguel Cardona will join us on the record. It's all coming up right now on 5 Plus. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Maxwell. Missouri Republicans kicked off their work in Jefferson City last week, promising tax relief, education reform, and lower crime. Right now, we go to Senate Republican Nick Schroer, who joins us on the record. It looks like he might be even on the road. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I want to start with one of the bills that you filed in the Missouri Senate, which would uh, return control of the St. Louis Police Department to the state of Missouri. What problem would that solve? Well, I think when you look at <clears throat> over the past couple of years, uh, during my lifetime, the city of St. Louis has always been in the top one, two, or three of the most violent cities, most deadly cities in America. And when you look at the business response, many businesses from Lexco, Carl's Jr., um, Brown and Crouppen and others have left the city of St. Louis. And this is a city that should be the economic generator of the state. By and large, it really is. But I see us going in the opposite direction. Since the, uh, the failed experiment of returning the control of the city of police back to the city of St. Louis, we've seen an increase in crime, an increase in deadly crime, violent crime, businesses fleeing, people fleeing. Uh, you know, I, I know all of us know somebody or we are that person that uh, doesn't want to go down to the city of St. Louis to see our teams play, the Blues, the Cardinals, the Battle Hawks, go to concerts. Uh, for me, as a parent of two young, beautiful girls, I only go down to the city of St. Louis for uh, day games, if I can go to a, a day blues game. Uh, so ultimately what this is going to do, uh, we've got the, the business community that has our backs. We've got the police in the city of St. Louis that are asking for solutions, asking for something different, because at this point, we've got our future to lose. We've got the future of uh, the business community, the future of our children, uh, with this violent crime uh, increasing in a lot of the recruitment and retention issues at the police department, uh, just getting worse day in, day out. So ultimately, this bill has been filed to bring everybody to the table, Republicans, Democrats. This is a city that does ultimately impact the entire state. And if we can't get crime under control, the future of the state does not look good. I hear you spelling out problems about crime and, and some of the concerns people have, but uh, I'll ask the question this way. What is it that the Missouri State Police Board could do that new police chief Robert Tracy cannot? Well, I think ultimately it would put everybody back at the table once again and not just uh, delegate this to the local officials in the city of St. Louis. We've seen corruption with three aldermen being indicted and pleading guilty. Uh, ultimately, uh, everybody wants the same goal, a safer St. Louis. So this would put uh, many people from the governor's picks to Mayor Tashara Jones picks at the table to find solutions, which they haven't been since 2013. Very interesting. I, there, there's another one of your bills that you filed. A number of your colleagues have filed something similar, which would, in essence, make it harder for voters to change the state constitution. Why? So what we've seen over the past uh, decade, I guess, since the uh, Hancock Amendment, Hancock was the last one, uh, a Missouri citizen, that utilized this ability to bypass the legislature and put something on the ballot for the people to vote on. Since then, we've seen out-of-state millionaires, whether it was clean Missouri, Medicaid expansion, uh, the national popular vote, so to speak. Um, so many different things that these entities out of state are coming in and putting in our constitution, things like bingo, the game, marijuana, um, so many different things where it's easy as long as you have the, the pocketbook to pay for people to go and collect signatures. Uh, it's it's making it more difficult for people um, to have their voices heard in the state of Missouri. So I think at the same time, while we're trying to make it more difficult for out of state billionaires to modify our constitution, the, the constitution of us living here in the state of Missouri, 
We also have to take into account um, loosening some restrictions or making it uh, more transparent if voters want to go the way that Hancock did in limiting the government's ability to raise taxes, uh, which I think we can all agree on. Uh, there should be some checks and balances there, but this system shouldn't be so easy uh, for these out-of-state millionaires to change our constitution. So whether it's changing the threshold of the signatures, uh, making it more transparent so people can actually see the entirety of these ballot measures, uh, or having some checks and balances with the legislature if you are going to change the Constitution, this needs to be modified. You're pointing to uh, ballot initiatives in the past about bingo or marijuana, and certainly reasonable people could look at 45 pages or so being stuffed into the Constitution and raise legitimate concerns about that, but those are ballot initiatives of the past. Demo Democrats in Missouri have their eyes on a ballot initiative in the immediate future, which would protect abortion access in Missouri. That's something they're organizing now. And at this same moment, Republicans are organizing an effort to raise that bar or change the rules in the middle of the game, some people might say. Is that part of the politics here is to play defense and prevent, prevent voters from enshrining abortion access in the state constitution? No, this is something that the Missouri House has taken up for a number of years. I know uh, Secretary of State Jay Ashcroft has spearheaded these efforts. The Missouri House has passed many different versions of this. And as you have seen the, the battlefield that the Missouri Senate has been, many of these things have died. Many of these priorities, like uh, enacting the Parents' Bill of Rights, giving uh, more transparency to parents, uh, to see where their money's going, what curriculum their kids are being taught. The, all of these things, including the initiative petition reforms, have not been taken up in the Senate. And, you know, we're, we're going to push for this once again. We're going to have a great debate. I am uh, glad some of my colleagues on the right and the left have made it over into the Senate. And that's, that's where I think this deliberative process needs to be taken. Um, but it has nothing to do with any of the ballot initiatives that are in the process uh, or, or, you know, failed in the past. All right, very interesting. You mentioned the curriculum in school rooms, and you have another bill right now uh, that would also allow the state's attorney general to uh, sue school districts. I think the AG may already have this, or the, at least the last attorney general felt he had this discretion, but you have a bill that would put that in statute that no school or school employee shall compel a teacher or student to adopt, affirm, adhere to, or profess ideas, and I'm reading from your bill, that individuals by virtue of their race, ethnicity, color, or national origin bear collective guilt and are inherently responsible for actions committed in the past by other members of the same race, ethnicity, color, or national origin. Uh, it looks like you want the state to be able to sue school districts if teachers do what? Teach history? So I don't think... Looking at that language, uh, blaming any race, whether you're black, white, blaming any culture, the Irish, uh, Scottish, Italians for anything that one person did. It's like blaming all Germans for the atrocities that Hitler was taking part in. I think it's incorrect and it's not history. Uh, when you look at like Project 1619 or critical race theory, which has components of blaming, uh, let's say anybody that is Caucasian as being an oppressor or, or trying to connect that somehow to the atrocities of slavery, rather than actually looking at history, rather than looking at the fact that Thomas Jefferson uh, in the, the drafting of the Declaration of Independence actually blamed King George III uh, for, for bringing this human atrocity here called slavery in uh, you know, that's the history we need to learn. We need to learn the history of the Democratic Party fighting many years ago to uh, stop the civil rights movement, enacting Jim Crow laws and so many things like that. But we're not blaming Democrats today for the people uh, of yesteryear, so to speak. So this was a bill that we uh, had pushed through the Education Committee. Those components were debated by Republicrats and ultimately that was the compromise that we came up with. So that's going to be the starting point of my bill this year, dealing with the Parents' Bill of Rights and trying to prevent any form of indoctrination, any form of third party infiltration into the history books. I think our, our kids need to learn history, all of the history, and not something that's been uh, cookie cutter, cut and pasted from a, a political party or a third, third party that's interested in selling books. All right, very interesting. We'll leave it there for now, but we look forward to exploring that debate as it uh, unravels further on the floor of the Missouri Senate, perhaps in the Missouri House as well. Senator Nick Schroer, thanks for joining us on the record. And we, uh, we wish him safe travels. I think he's in his car there. All right, Illinois will no longer allow the legal sale of assault weapons, high-capacity magazines, 
or rapid fire devices anywhere in the state as of Tuesday night. That's when Governor JB Pritzker signed that assault weapons ban into law at the state capitol. We were there and brought you this reporting. We got it done. Gun safety advocates celebrated at the State House Tuesday night as Governor J.B. Pritzker signed a ban on selling assault weapons into Illinois law. Illinois now officially prohibits the sale and distribution of these mass killing machines and rapid fire devices. The changes include new tracking measures allowing state police to publish serial numbers of stolen guns online. I think it's incredibly uh, important because the number of guns that get repeat uh, used in crimes is is very high. The law spells out a list of banned guns and outlaws their sale, transfer or purchase. The law keeps the legal age to buy a long gun at 18 and allows gun owners who already have a banned weapon to keep it on their private property but requires them to register the serial number with the Illinois State Police. Some Republican lawmakers but vowed to defy the new law. Uh, we will not comply and you're not going to do a darn thing about it. Well, you don't get to choose which laws you comply with in the state of Illinois. Let's be clear. No, I will not comply. Republican Darren Bailey lost his November race against Pritzker after a campaign where he called to void the state's FOID card. So when you say you won't comply, does that mean you won't register your gun with... That is correct. I have no intention of registering anything. Yes, there are, of course, people who are trying to politically grandstand, uh, who want to make a name for themselves by claiming that they will not comply. But the reality is that the state police is responsible for enforcement, as are all law enforcement all across this state. And they will, in fact, do their job or they won't be in their job. And gun rights advocates have already threatened to sue and try to block that assault weapons ban in Court. Illinois' inaugural ceremony is also happening this week at the State House, where the House and Senate swore in. It was less changing of the guard and more cementing of the status quo, at least for now, as Democrats remain in the supermajority in both the House and Senate. But new changes at the top for House Republicans for the first time in their history, nominating a woman to lead their ranks. And with a country and political climate increasingly polarized and bitterly divided, both leaders, House Speaker Chris Welch and House Republican leader Tony McCombie, uh, defended the legislative process as a path toward progress. If you've ever watched any of our floor debates, you know Leader McCombie and I have disagreed. Debate and disagreement are necessary steps toward compromise and cooperation. Don't be afraid. Bring us to the table. Any preconceived notions about Republicans is false. We want to govern. I can't hear him all of a sudden. Voice in Illinois politics now, and at least for the next two years, she joins us now, I believe, from the Illinois State Capitol. There she is in her new office. Uh, Leader McCombie, good to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Uh, we heard some of your remarks there. You were sort of challenging Speaker Welch to uh, let him bring some of your uh, Republican colleagues and their ideas to the table. This sort of seems to be one of these ongoing debates in Illinois about whether or not Republican voices get heard. Uh, what are some of the topics, what are some of the uh, agenda items high on your list where, where you think you feel comfortable Republicans can force the issue and influence policy? Oh, I, I think we would be very instrumental to be used for um, some education issues that we're having, certainly reading literacy, um, the budget. Uh, we need to have some budgeteers and actually be part of that process. Uh, public safety, business regulations, the list can go on and on. Does that require some Republicans showing a little bit more flexibility or willingness in voting yes? Because as you know, for a long time, the status quo has been for Republicans to vote no or take a walk and just vote present. Very rarely would they actually put a yes vote on a budget or something else, save for dire circumstances. Are, are you going to rethink that hard no position for the caucus? Well, it's not my position. I, I represent the 89th district and everybody has their own districts to vote. So um, I have uh, been lucky enough to, to actually be able to vote yes on a budget before. Uh, however, as, as you're fully aware, these budgets are extremely large and have a lot of pork in them. And we're not going to continue to support that kind of a spend. Uh, the the federal money is going to stop and all of this increased spending is going to have to be either stopped or paid for. And what I'm nervous uh, will come a, a tax increase. And I'm certainly not going to support that. And I would ask any of my members not to support that. You also spoke about a return to checks and balances where the legislature holds the executive in check and acts more as an equal branch and not as a deferential one. Uh, 
was I, I don't want to read between the lines. I'll let you speak for yourself. Were you referring back to what Republicans criticized that an, as an overreach of executive power during the pandemic? Something else? What were you referring to? I think it's a combination of things. Absolutely. The governor just yesterday uh, declared another disaster. So here we are. What, what number is this? 38, 39, somewhere in there. Uh, so we have that, of course. But really, the checks and balances with us holding 40 seats out of 118, um, that's not good for Republicans, Democrats or independents. We have to have more of a balance in our house. And uh, so we've got some work to do there. During the pandemic and the use of the governor's executive pandemic powers, we saw a lot of law enforcement officials say, we choose not to recognize this assertion of power because it didn't go through the legislature. It was, they, they saw it as executive overreach. Just this week, the legislature wrote new laws banning assault weapons and the governor signed it into law going through that proper process. And yet again, we have some law enforcement officials saying they won't enforce an assault weapons ban. Do you fear that undermines the legitimacy of the legislature? No, I don't think so. I think that's the question of the Constitution uh, and how how is in the bill. There is nothing in there saying how they're supposed to find these guns, how they're going to go into people's homes. Uh, also, I believe um, the majority of the people believe in the Second Amendment and support the Second Amendment. And that's why they're not going to do that. Uh, this bill will go to the go to the courts for sure and if it comes out of the the courts uh in our in the favor of second amendment uh folks they will come back and they will try to write another bill uh this is this will be a, a never-ending process uh but this still and we need to we need to be honest this is not going to do anything this bill is not going to do anything about the root causes. It's not going to stop gun crimes in Chicago or anywhere else across the state. And if we don't get together and start addressing those issues, then this will never stop. What was your reaction to your immediate predecessor, House Republican leader Jim Durkin, voting for the assault weapons ban? Uh, he voted his district, and I respect that. Interesting. Uh, whether it's politically or practically, uh, and, and you, you mentioned some of the challenges in law enforcement actually finding assault weapons that aren't registered. How, how would they find them? That's an open question. But politically speaking, wouldn't that change the narrative that we've heard for so long that these are, quote, law abiding gun owners if they're not abiding by the, the laws on the books? Yeah, I think the, the bill was drafted to do just that, to make law-abiding gun owners no longer law-abiding gun owners. I think that's the intent. Very interesting. Uh, before we let you go, um, I, I wonder if you, uh, we, we saw also uh, the, the expansion of abortion access, again, lowering the licensing hurdles for some uh, nurses and physician assistants to perform abortions. And also there was some extra protections and uh, speedier processes granted to doctors, perhaps in neighboring states or other states that might face punishment uh, if they were to carry out an abortion procedure or a trans uh, transgender transition procedure and face punishment in a red state like that, they would face some sort of protection in Illinois or be allowed to practice in Illinois without losing their license. What do you make of this ongoing sort of tit for tat, red state versus blue state fight to the left or to the right on abortion or on transgender medicine or any of these sort of expanding social ideas? Is that a sustainable path that our country is on? <laughs> I, I really can't tell you if that's the, that's the path, but I'm not sure if you saw yesterday, um, Representative Howder, was that yesterday? No, a couple days ago. It's been a long uh, week. Yeah, it's been a long week. Yeah, uh, he was stating uh, the concerns he has as a, a physician, staying away from even the pro-life or pro-choice view. It was about the safety of it. And that is going to really be a concern. And I, I'm not sure if you're aware, malpractice insurance is pretty high in Illinois. So uh, that's going to cause some issues for uh, non-physicians to be doing these kind of medical procedures. Uh, how are they going to handle emergencies? They're not they're not prepared to do that. Like you said, you know, the, the, the surgery, I, I would recommend you go look at it. But the surgery itself, you can teach somebody, but you can't. A physician is going to be there for the emergency. So that's going to be a, a real issue. 
Um, there's other pieces of Representative uh, Windhorse talked about um, how it is going to have some issues with federal uh, laws in place. So there again, it's just another example of a bill that's drafted without looking at what's currently in the books, whether it's the Illinois Constitution or the federal uh, Constitution. It's like mm -hmm. they have got to start being prepared and better at how they're preparing their bills. All right, we've talked a lot about the legislative agenda for House Republicans in Illinois. Before we let you go, a political question, if I may. Uh, House Republicans have never had fewer members in their caucus at any time in modern history, uh, going back, I mean, a, a long time. You're at the smallest numbers, uh, certainly since before the cutback amendment, but even just in total, before then you had more members. So somehow you've got to rebuild the party. I wonder when you look back at the Workers' Rights Amendment, in November, which you could look at maybe as a publicly sponsored poll. Yes, it changed the Constitution, but it also gave you a read on what voters think about workers' rights and labor unions and their strength in Illinois. Your position is unique because you're not just the first woman to hold that title, but you're also the first downstate Republican to lead a caucus in a long time. I, I, uh, I know you're from Western Illinois, but they call it downstate. Uh, do, do you think that that is an indication that Republicans should embrace unions as a path toward growing your membership, growing uh, the number of seats that you hold in elected office? Listen, the Republican Party has always supported the working class. That's getting more apparent in the public, actually. Um, the, the map is a big issue of our numbers. And if you look back in history, the last, ten, the last map and the map before that, we lost seven members, we lost five members, and here we are now today losing five members. So it seems to be the, the, the way it goes after a map. The Democrats are in control. I said yesterday in my speech, it was the worst gerrymandered map in, in the nation. There's no doubt about that. It was drawn to have 78 hard Democrats, and uh, here we are, and we're gonna have to rebuild with that. And I have every intention to do just that. All right, House Republican Leader Tony McCombe, thank you for joining us. We look forward to tracking and following these developments over this General Assembly. Thanks. Appreciate it. Union scored another big win in Illinois in the waning hours of the lame duck session just before new members were inaugurated on Wednesday at noon. Uh, they secured a guaranteed one week of paid sick leave. Take a listen. We are sending a message throughout the country that we are labor friendly and that we're family friendly and we're open for business. In one of their final acts at the lame duck session, Illinois lawmakers approved a full week of paid sick leave for all employees. At the House inauguration ceremony, Speaker Chris Welch signaled workers could see similar proposals in the new General Assembly. We must continue fighting for relief for those middle class and struggling families hit hardest by unstable markets because we believe the system should reward work, not wealth. That is what I call uh, political rhetoric because um, you have to have wealth to be able to take to people to own companies to be able to provide jobs. House Republican Dave Severin owns a small business and voted against paid leave, arguing the extra benefits will hurt his company's bottom line when that law kicks in at the start of 2024. I feel like it will empower workers to help their employers be even better. If you focus on motivating and keeping your workers satisfied, overall production will be great for the, for the organization. Not business friendly at all. I own, I own two businesses. And for the opportunity, you know, people need opportunities and people need help and assistance. And, and uh, what we are doing is we are pushing down uh, business owners. Those benefits would not apply to contract workers in the so-called gig economy. Governor Pritzker signaled he will sign it in a statement where he called it a, quote, safety net for hardworking Illinoisans. The financial future of millions of student loan borrowers across the country hangs in the balance at the U.S. Supreme Court. We may not hear a final answer on the outcome of President Biden's student loan debt forgiveness plan until later this summer. In the meantime, the White House is rolling out a new plan that operates on a separate track but is related. Uh, it would change the payment plan schedule to reduce or halt loan repayment altogether depending on how much you make. You might think of it as a progressive uh, repayment schedule. The Department of Education has paused federal student loan repayment for everyone through the month of June, but if and when they start collecting again, it will be at different rates and different timelines. For example, a single person making less than $30,600 a year, their payments would be paused at $0 a month. The debt would not be forgiven outright, but the repayment of it would be set at $0. That same pause would also apply to a family of four 
earning $62,400. For more insight into this new plan and the ongoing court battle over outright forgiveness, President Biden's Education Secretary Miguel Cardona joins us on the record. Happy to be with you. The Biden administration's decision to suspend or forgive student loan debt during this last year captured the attention of almost everyone, whether you had student loans with the federal government or not. A lot of people are still watching this case very closely. I know there's no decision imminent at the Supreme Court, but what are your lawyers telling you about the likelihood of victory at the Supreme Court? Well, first of all, let me just say what blue collar, hardworking middle class Americans are telling me thank you for fighting for us. Um, and we feel very confident that we're going to prevail here. Look, the HEROES Act provides authority for me in a national emergency to provide some waivers. And that's what we're doing. Much like in the last administration, there were some uh, waivers in loan costs. Um, we, we know this is the right thing to do. We know that 90% uh, of the benefits here are going to go to people making under $75,000. So we're confident with that case. And we know uh, that people need, just like small businesses need a little hand, we know middle class Americans that have high student debt also need some help. That's the old plan still in limbo. Now there's a new plan coming from the Biden administration could come into place soon. Can you describe basically, I, I understand that uh, people at the bottom end of the earning or income scale would see all of their payments paused, but the debt not forgiven. How would that work? Sure. Yeah, let me explain it. So, you know, let me contextualize this, Mark. You know, from day one, we're working really hard to put the student first, to put the borrower first, and to make higher education more accessible. So we have the loan forgiveness plan. We have public service loan forgiveness that we fixed. It's a broken system and we're fixing it. Here, we have income-driven repayment based on people's salary, right? So if someone's making $30,500, they're barely making it. They're barely paying the rent. If they have children, it's really difficult. Anyone making less than $30,500, uh, we'll see a zero balance. As their salary increases, it would go up proportionately. Um, so basically what we're doing is, is also cutting uh, for undergraduate loans, uh, the amount of income that a person has to devote to student loans from 10% to 5%. So in essence, we're reducing in half college loan payments for undergraduates who are getting their feet under them. Maybe they have you know $100,000 in debt and they're starting off in a job making $35,000, $40,000. You know, their increase their salary will increase, but right now they can't afford a 6-700 loan payments. We're cutting them in half. That could come as good news perhaps to folks who don't have that extra money to go around and they're looking for breathing room in their budgets during a period of ongoing inflation. But I wonder if the announcement you're making might also look to them like perhaps you're trying to relieve the sting of looming defeat in court. Uh, maybe this signals that uh, once we start collecting debt again, we're not going to try and collect it all at once or not try to collect it as aggressively. Is that what this is, sort of a salve? You know, it, they're really, um, they work together in, in support of um, borrowers, but both of these strategies are part of a bigger strategy that we're doing to make higher education more affordable and more accessible. What we're trying to do here is provide a, a repayment plan that works to prevent what we've been seeing over the last several years is over a million people defaulting a year in their loan repayment. So this isn't a backup plan? No, no, not at all. No, we're, uh, we've been working hard, Mark. Look, we have public service loan forgiveness, borrower defense. We're working on a simplified FAFSA. We have income-driven repayment. We're doing targeted loan uh, relief. This is all part of a major plan to give access to the American dream to more people. Um, one plan is not a backup for another. We are just rolling up our sleeves and working hard to fix a broken system. And these are two components of it. How do you respond to some critics who, uh, many in our audience, who question the basis for the student loan debt forgiveness being grounded or rooted in emergency pandemic powers? Are you arguing that the pandemic and the it's emergency, not... the national emergency is still ongoing today? You know, you talk to the people that I've talked to who are struggling to get back on. Um, whose child care system was disrupted in the last couple, three years. Um, and, and to me, I make it analogous to small businesses that needed a support to get back on their feet. Now we have 40 million Americans, you know, 90% of the dollars go to people making under $75,000. If you ask people making under $75,000, and that means parents who are paying for their child to go to college, it's not just the, the student. You know, we're talking about blue collar folks who are helping pay 
for their child's education, could they use some support? Could they use $10,000 off their loan payments? Or if they're eligible for Pell, which means that they have some financial challenges already, could they benefit from $20,000 so they could buy a house and add to the economy? The answer is always going to be yes, I could use that to help contribute to the economy. We're confident that we're helping everyday Americans, much like we help small businesses or we help industry when they were in trouble too. One last question before we let you go here. Missouri has a very particular part to play in this ongoing legal battle, the court case about the forgiveness portion, because the state legislature relies on and uses future loan repayments and any of the interest collected there to sort of backfill their own ongoing state budget plan to fund higher education. It's sort of a circular funding mechanism. That's why the state was found to be a party to this lawsuit. Is that sound education policy from your vantage point for the state to count on that future debt repayment to fund future higher education? It seems like there's sort of a bubble there. What we're asking state and local leaders to do is match the urgency of the president of the United States to help blue collar, regular, hardworking Americans get back on their feet. Um, you look at the policies and say, how can I help um, the middle class Americans that need to get back on their feet after the pandemic and not look to tax or make benefit from um, supports that the federal government are providing? You know, we're all in this together. And when, when they struggle or when they go into bankruptcy or default, the whole economy suffers. Let's wrap our arms around the middle class Americans, unlike some of the tax rebates and tax plans in the last administration. Let's help the middle class get back on their feet. That's how this country thrives. That was uh, Miguel Cardona, the education secretary. We thank him for joining us uh, and helping to explain. You can see the Biden administration trying to demonstrate and show the American public some sensitivity to the pain of ongoing inflation, even as uh, the Federal Reserve looks at raising rates and that continues. If you thought the 2022 midterm political season was a lot to handle, well, 2024 isn't that far away. One of our regular guests on this program is Senator Josh Hawley. He may have just earned a challenger if Lucas Kuntz can get out of the Democratic primary this time. The prolific fundraiser has already announced he's running in the Democratic primary to challenge Hawley in 2024. And he will be our guest not next week, but the week after on the 26th here on The Record. We hope you will join us for that interview in the weeks to come. We will see you next week on The Record.